Welcome to Electron Online. In our quest to understand what a photon is, we're now going to take a look at what we call the Compton scattering. So Compton had discovered when a photon would be approaching an electron, and if it approaches just right, it would be scattered by the proton in various angles, depending upon the approach uh, vector. Good way to say it. And what was interesting was that the amount of energy lost by the photon as it was scattered would depend upon the scattering angle. So here we have a little picture. We have an approaching photon. It's coming in contact, and I'll put that in quotation marks, with an electron so that the photon would be scattered in one direction and the electron would then be scattered in the other direction. And the change in the wavelength of the photon, which means they would lose some energy, the photon would lose some energy, is equal to h divided by the mass of the, the electron times the speed of light times the quantity of 1 minus the cosine of the scattering angle of the photon. So which means that if there was no scattering angle at all, for example, if the photon just continued on its merry way and was not affected by the electron, kept going straight, of course the cosine of zero degrees is one, one minus one is zero, and there would not be any change in the wavelength. On the other hand, if for some reason the photon approached the electron and was scattered in such a way that it returned back in the opposite direction so that the scattering angle was 180 degrees, then 1 minus the cosine of 180, which is a minus 1, this quantity would become 2. We would then get a maximum value. In other words, there would be a maximum change in the wavelength of the photon if the photon was simply scattered back in the opposite direction. And the other angle between 0 and 180 degrees would be some fraction between 0 and and 2 it would be some quantity between 0 and 2. Very interesting concept, especially so when you start thinking about the difference between what a photon is and what an electron is. An electron is a very small point particle, roughly the size of 1 times 10 to the minus 18 meters, much smaller than the diameter of a nucleus. And a photon, in comparison, even a very high energy photon like an X-ray or gamma ray photon, is huge in comparison. The wavelength of a photon is much greater than the size of an electron. So you might wonder, how can a photon, which is a particle, an energy particle, so to speak, collide with an electron and be scattered by it? It's not like there's a physical collision like between two billiard balls, for example. But what's happening is, since a photon causes a changing electric field, the changing electric field as a photon zips by the electron at the speed of the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second, or 300,000 kilometers per second, while it's zipping by at very high speed, that changing electric field of the photon causes a change in the electron, because the electron is a charged particle, which would then feel the effect of the changing electric field. And because of that, there would be an effect, there would be a scattering effect of the photon and the electron. And momentum will be conserved in the collision, and also energy will be conserved in the collision. We'll look at that at a later video. So what we need to see here is that we have three parts to this equation. We have the left part here, which indicates the change in the wavelength. This would be the final wavelength of the photon leaving that event. This is the initial wavelength of the incoming photon. This quantity right here is only dependent upon the mass of the particle that we're colliding with or that the photon is colliding with. This would in this case be like say the, math of a, the mass of an electron, but it could also potentially be a proton. H is a constant and C is a constant. This is Planck's constant, this is, of course the speed of light. And then this quantity here is a simply a number that's dependent upon the scattering angle. Since this quantity over here will be a constant if we're dealing with a particular particle, in this case the electron, and this quantity right here is simply a number between 0 and 2, that means that the change in the wavelength is simply a function of the scattering angle. And irregardless, and this is the interesting part of it, I think, irregardless of the wavelength of the incoming photon, the difference will always be a constant value depending upon the scattering angle. So it doesn't really matter if this is a very high energy photon coming in, like a gamma ray or x-ray photon, or maybe a visible light photon. If there's any sort of interaction, the change in the wavelength will be a constant value only dependent on the scattering angle and the mass of the particle, not on the wavelength of the incoming photon, which is really strange in a way, but that's what we found it to be true. The reason why we know that is so, we had put detectors on there, so what we had done is we had kind of put a, a detector going around like this that could 
move in different angles and so we could actually measure the income or the scattered photons at various angles we can measure the wavelength or energy of those photons we're going to have a given set of photons coming in at, at a given known wavelength and so we can then actually measure the energy and therefore the wavelength of the scattered photon and we discovered then that this was the equation that met the the data that we measured from that experiment experiment and of course this was Compton who did that experiment so it's really interesting that there's no dependency on the incoming photon. So what we're going to do now is calculate these various quantities. So let's calculate this quantity for an electron. So for an electron, we can say that H over MC is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. That would be joules times seconds divided by the mass, which is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms and the speed of light 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So what would that quantity equal? So let's find out with a calculator. So 6.626 e to the 34 minus, that would be divided by 9.11 e to the 31 minus, and divided by 3 e to the 8, and we get a quantity of 2.42, so it would be 2.42, that's good enough, times 10, to the minus 12, and remember that the units would be units of wavelength, that would be meters, so it would be 2.42 times 10 to the minus 12 meters, which is 2.42 picometers. Notice that it's much, much smaller than the typical wavelength of a photon. Now, this quantity here would be a number between 0 and 2. If the scattering angle is 0 degrees, then the answer would be 0. If the scattering angle is 180 degrees, that would be a 2. That means that this would then vary in, in, in a range anywhere from 0 to twice that number, so I multiply times 2, and I get 4.85, 4.85 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. So that means that this quantity right here would be a number anywhere between 0 and 4.85 times 10 to the minus 12 meters, which means that's a change in the wavelength of the scattered photon. And since that number does not depend on the wavelength of the incoming photon, lambda sub now would be the initial wavelength of the incoming photon, that if this is a photon with very large wavelength, let's say the wavelength of visible light, 500 times 10 to the minus 9 meters, this change would be so minuscule compared to that, we could not see or measure that effect with photons of visible light. We could only measure that with photons that are comparable in size, such as X-ray photons, which may be 100 picometers or 500 picometers in length, in wavelength. We could then see that change. It would be subtle, but it could be measured. But for something as large as a visible wavelength, there's no specific effect in the Compton scattering. So that means that when the wavelengths are even much bigger, now here I drew a wavelength, even though it seems very large compared to the size of an electron, Imagine a wavelength of a photon of visible light. That may as, be as big as a freeway. Imagine the size of a freeway and putting a small little grain of sand on the freeway and imagine that the freeway is the photon and the grain of sand is the actual electron. And you can see when the photons are really big, the effect on the electron between the electron and the photon would be virtually nil. That means that the change in the wavelength could not even be measured. But if the photon becomes much smaller in relationship to the size of the electron, still very big, but much smaller than the freeway, of course, then you can see that there would be a much bigger effect, and so the change in the wavelength would become a larger and larger and larger part of the wavelength of the incoming photon. And therefore, the change in the energy of the photon, because the energy, of course, is related to the, to the wavelength, the change in energy would also be much greater an effect on photons that have a much higher energy than for the ones that have much lower energy. In other words, much smaller wavelengths versus much larger wavelengths. So again, we're trying to understand what a photon is in how it relates to the different interfaces, interactions that it has with other properties, with other things such as electrons and protons. So when a photon collides with an electron, and collide of course is kind of a strange term, when it interacts with, a, with an electron, if the wavelengths are very small of photon, there's a real, sen real interaction that can be measured. If the wavelength is really large compared to the electron, it's an unmeasurable interaction. But what would it be if instead of an electron, that was a proton? What would the effect be then? So let's try that. So now let's say that we have a proton, and now we're going to 
calculate the H over MC, so the Compton scattering with a photon and a proton instead of a photon and an electron. So this would be 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34, that's joules times seconds, divided by the mass of a proton would be 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, and multiply times the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And let's see what we get this time. So 6.626 e to the 34 minus, divide by 1.67 e to the 27 minus, and divide by 3 e to the 8, and there we get 1.32 times 10 to the minus 15. So 1.32 times 10 to the minus 15 meters. Notice this represents the portion that determines the change in the wavelength. And with a proton, the change in the wavelength would be much, much less than when it interacts with an electron. And again, using the same scattering angle concept here, that would be anywhere from zero to twice that much, so this times two. So we get 2.65 times 10 to the minus 15 meters. So even with a very high energy X-ray photon, you could not measure the scattering or the change in the wavelength due to the scattering, the Compton scattering, when the particle was a proton instead of an electron. So Compton scattering is something that we can measure when we use electrons, when we use protons, it's virtually nil. So what is the difference between the interaction between a photon and an electron and a photon and a proton? A proton, of course, would be much bigger. A proton would be something like this in relationship to an electron. And yet, the interaction is such that the scattering angle would cause virtually no change in the wavelength and therefore no change in the energy of um, a photon. Well, part of that may be that the necessity of the conservation momentum plays a role in this. The reason is because when a photon hits an electron, it bumps the electron and it goes off, speeding off at some high velocity because of the conservation momentum. But the proton is so large when a photon hits it, there can be much of a change in the momentum of the, of the proton and the change in the energy of the proton, which would be one-half mv squared, and so therefore the change in the photon there necessarily would have to be very small because that large particle would be so difficult to move. So again, it's interesting how even at the quantum mechanic state, the interaction between photons and particles give us a visibility into what these particles might be. So hopefully this helps us again get us a little better understanding of what a photon is in the way it interacts with electrons and protons in the Compton scattering. And that's how we figured it out.